All right, we're here in Acts chapter 16. This is obviously a very famous passage for us that are soul winners. And obviously we know Acts 16 verses 30 and 31. But I want to address this question that you know I've heard from a lot of people. And oftentimes it's from people that are pastors and their church doesn't really go soul winning. But maybe they do. Or people in a church that they go soul winning. And they're just like, why doesn't anybody at our church go soul winning? And they ask that question, why does our church not go soul winning? Why don't people go soul winning? So I want to preach a sermon on reasons why people don't go soul winning. Because I think it's very clear in the Bible that God tells us to go soul winning. Because he says, go ye into all the world. Ye is plural. So when it says, go ye into all the world, he's not saying, hey, I just want you 12 people to reach the entire world. No, he's saying, I want everybody. Go ye into all the world. So we know that we're supposed to go soul winning, and yet people don't go soul winning. So the question is, why don't they? And so we have three points in this sermon, but there are sub-points on on especially the first point. And so the the first reason why is due to fear. Due to fear. A lot of people do not go soul winning simply because they are afraid. That's the reality. Now, there's many reasons why they are afraid. Okay, now I want you to notice here in Acts 16, verses 30 and 31, then I'll explain this here in a second. But it says in Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay? Now I want you to understand there are many things that we should do. We should read the Bible. We should go to church. We should pray. We should get sin out of our lives. But what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And so the thing you must do to be saved is believe. It does not say believe and get baptized. It does not say believe and live a good life. It makes it very clear that it's just by believing. Now, us that are saved, this is plain and this is simple and it makes perfect sense. Right. But honestly, one reason why people are afraid to go soul winning is they quite simply don't understand salvation that well. And I'm talking about people that are saved. Look, some people get saved and they hear a lot of false preaching. And due to false preaching... They're kind of confused about salvation themselves. And if you ask them this question, do you need to repent of your sins? They're going to be like, I don't know. What does the word repent mean? I don't know. They're confused. And because they're confused a little bit, they're not going to be confident to preach the gospel. And so these pastors that wonder, why is it I can't get my members to go soul winning? You're just not being clear enough about salvation. Right. Right. That's a big reason why. Look, if I just walked up to Brother Chris before this sermon and said, hey, I want you to preach this two minutes before the sermon, is he going to be confident? No. Because he doesn't even know what I'm I'm talking about. He's going to quickly look and be like, okay, I need to preach on this and this and this. He's not going to have much confidence because he doesn't understand this that well because he just looked at it. Right. If I hadn't written this, I wouldn't understand it very well. Right. I mean, I could look at it and learn from it, but I mean, two minutes before, I wouldn't have any confidence, right? See, the more you understand something and the better you understand it, the more confident you're going to be to present it. Right. Look, I'm confident to preach this sermon here today, but do you think that I'd be confident to give some lecture about, I don't know, some foreign language I don't know? Well, no, because I don't understand it. Yeah. And see, some say people, they hear a lot of false preaching or their pastors aren't clear, or their churches aren't clear, or their churches are preaching a false gospel, and the members are a little bit confused themselves, and they don't know what to say. Let me give you an example. I got saved when I was 18, and I listened to lots of IFB preaching right after I got saved. The problem was some of that preaching was good, and some of it was bad, but I was a new believer, so I didn't really realize that. You know, I didn't realize what this repentance topic was. And I heard a lot of preaching that said, you must remember the exact moment you got saved, and you basically, you know, once you get saved, there's going to be a little bit of a change. And they make the moment so monumental that you start to get wondering, well, when I prayed to receive Christ, you know, did I, did I have that moment like I'm supposed to have? And so you're not really questioning God about your salvation, but you're questioning, did I say it right? You know, did I have that right feeling? And it's basically confusing the message of salvation. And what I've heard is this example that, hey, you know what, if you met the President of the United States... Or if you met President Duterte, would you ever forget that moment? Well, of course not. I would never forget that. Well, what if you met the the king of the universe? Would you ever forget that moment? And then so basically they give that example to basically say that, hey, if you, you have to have such a clear moment of when you got saved, and if you're not sure, then you must not be saved. Now, look, I do have a clear moment when I got saved. Not everybody does, though. 
Right. I remember exactly when I changed from, from believing a false gospel to the true gospel. I do have that moment, but you know, if somebody believes the right message of salvation right now, then they're saved. Amen. Right. Right. That's the truth. Even if they're kind of fuzzy on the exact moment because they heard a lot of preaching and they're not sure when they got it. Hey, if you believe the right message right now, you're saved. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Now, obviously, there is a moment where you get born, but quite honestly, some people are confused about this. But this is why that example is a bobo and stupid example. Amen. Right. Let me give you an example why. Because here's the thing. I do not remember when I was born. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah. I cannot remember. Because if you're going to give an example, why not give ones from the Bible? Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about meeting the king of the universe. Well, what more applicable example of being born again of when you're actually born? I do not remember when I was born into this world. Right. I mean, do you remember that moment? But guess what? You're alive. Yeah. You obviously have the moment you were born. And so look, you know what? Honestly... Do most people know? Probably, but honestly, some people are confused at the exact moment where they switch from believing something else to putting their full faith in Jesus. And so some people are confused about that moment, but if you believe the right gospel now, faith is the evidence. Amen. How do you know if somebody's saved? What do they believe? Yeah, and so right. when you heard this preaching, or when I heard this preaching about how, man, you got to have this monumental moment... I'm like, you know, I, I don't know, did I fully get it then? Did I pray it again one time? And there's like a third time? Because you're hearing this preaching, it confuses you that, hey, I, I thought I got saved, but I'm not reading the Bible, so maybe I'm not really saved. That's what they're basically saying. I thought I got saved, but man, I, I'm not going so many regularly. Maybe I'm not really saved because there's supposed to be some sort of change. That's not what the Bible teaches. Man, man. But when pastor's salvation message is kind of in between, people are confused. And if they're not even confident themselves, how are they going to be confident to go out there and preach the gospel? Right. They won't even know what to say. Right. right. See, the reason why it's so important that you thunder against repentance of sins is because it helps us all understand, hey, when I preach the gospel, i got to make sure I make it clear you do not have to repent. Man, yeah, you do right. not have to get baptized. You do not have to go to church. You have to make it clear to people so they can have confidence, hey, this is what I need to tell people. Look, in our church, we make it clear that once you're saved, you're always saved. And it makes people realize, man, when I'm preaching the gospel, I better make sure it's clear to people that you cannot lose your salvation. Oh, yeah. I better make sure it's clear to people they don't have to repent of your sins. And so a church that makes salvation very clear ends up having people that have confidence and not fear to preach the gospel. Right. You say, well, how do people – now turn to Jonah 3. Jonah 3. Now, in Acts 16, as you're turning to Jonah 3, I want you to understand that the, 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 the salvation message he gives is more than just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what you call the synopsis. Basically, the summary of what they said is belief. That doesn't mean that his gospel presentation was 10 seconds. <laughs> it was longer than that. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of Baptist churches say, well, you know, all I do is say, hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. No, you've got to explain that. Right. Obviously, you know, he said more than just those words, but the synopsis, the summary is belief. And when we preach the gospel, we say a lot. 15, 20 minute conversation, but the summary of that is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do people answer these verses that believe in a false gospel? This is what I've heard from people that are part of cults that, that say you got to get baptized to go to heaven. They'll say, well, all it says is believe, right? Right. But does it end there? No, because then he got baptized. Well, yeah, he got baptized. It doesn't change the fact that all you must do is believe. Right. right. Just because he started to live for God doesn't mean it's automatic. Now, I've heard people that say you have to repent of your sins. And what they say in Acts 16 is, well, all he says is believe. But what that shows you was when they were in prison, they were singing praises about repentance. And so basically, they already heard them talk about repentance, and all they had to do was say believe, because in their song, that is what made the guy just say, what must I do to be saved? Because he heard that song about, he heard victory in Jesus, and then he just hit the deck, and it's like, I repented of my sins. Man, I want that message. Now, that's ridiculous. Right. What must I do to be saved? And they said believe. And, and look, we use verses like John 3.16. That's the most famous verse in the Bible. If you want to show me some verse from Ezekiel, why don't you explain to me John 3, 16? That Amen. Whosoever believe it, right. anybody that believes, whether or not they repent, whether or not they don't. Now, Jonah 3, 10 is another very clear verse about salvation or what is not salvation. And it says in Jonah 3, verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. According to the Bible, 
Turning from your evil way is works. Amen. Right. When you have to quit drinking, that is works. Man, uh, yeah. When you have to quit lying, that's works. Man. When you have to make lifestyle changes, that is work according to Jonah 3.10. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. But how many churches make that clear? Even churches that are right on salvation would rarely turn to a verse like this. Right, yeah. Most churches that are right on salvation, they will fight the repentance topic. Yeah. They will avoid right. it. Yeah. And the problem is your members will never go soul winning. Right. Because right. they're confused now. You have to make it clear. And look, there are some Baptist pastors that believe the right salvation message here in the Philippines. But unfortunately, most of them don't make it plain. Right, right. Yeah. Most of them don't make it simple. And they wonder why their members have no confidence to preach the gospel. Because they're not quite sure what to say. Sure. At this church, we know what to say because it's preached very clearly. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Look, this same verse says God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Is God a sinner? No. But wait a minute, God repented. I thought repentance was to turn from your sins according to these people. If, if turning from your sins is what repent means, then apparently God is a sinner. And you say, well, that's just one verse. There's no one in the Bible that repents more than God. Right. The first person in the Bible that repents is God. And more than anybody, it's God. Because turning from your sins is not the same thing as repentance. Right. And so they can say that all day as much as they want. But then God is a sinner, apparently. And according to this verse, turning from your evil way, that is works. You say, what does repent mean? It basically means to change your mind. Right. And so, yes, people can change their mind about their sin. But the word repent itself just means to change. Yes. And so God chooses not to destroy Nineveh. He said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh unless they change. And then they changed. And God said, well, I repented of the evil that I had said that it would do one. He says, I would have destroyed them. But because of the fact they did turn from their sins, God says, I'm not going to destroy them. They turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil he would have done. And God decided not to do it. So you can change or turn from many different things. It's not just simply referring to your sins. And so when the Bible says, repent ye and believe, what it's saying is you change your mind about what you believe, right. and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You quit trusting the seven sacraments to get you to heaven, and you yeah. believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You quit trusting in baptism to get you to heaven, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You quit trusting in repentance of sins to get you to heaven. You repent of that belief, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't we make it very clear at this church? Right. Yes. We make it very clear, but quite honestly, most churches don't make it that clear. Turn to Habakkuk 2. Habakkuk 2. There's a famous pastor here in the Philippines, famous Baptist pastor that you know, is a Calvinist. He preaches a false gospel, and he preaches a sermon I listen to, and he's like wondering, you know, man, why can't I get my members to go soul winning? He's like, you don't really hear a lot of preaching about soul winning in life sovereignty. <laughs> and he's like, I just don't understand why, why won't my members go soul winning. It's because, you know what, you're very confusing on what you believe. Right. For one, you're preaching a false gospel. For two, they don't even understand because you could go to most churches and ask everybody around the church, what do you have to do to be saved? And you're going to hear a dozen different answers. Right. Yeah. Some people are going to say, well, I don't know, Sundin on the seven sacraments. <laughs> I don't know, Gumuan on Mabuti. I don't know, you know, Panama Palatai, Panama Palatai along. No, also, you know, be a good person. <laughs> yes, you know, it's faith, but, you know, of course you're going to get baptized and you're going to obey God's commandments too. Look, you're going to hear a lot of different answers. You're not going to hear a lot of different answers to this church. Right. right. It's going to be very clear what we believe. Look, if you ask a question around this room, hey, what if a saved person commits suicide, what will happen? Now, if you ask that at most churches, there's going to be a lot of confusion. Right. Right. There's not confusion at our church. Man, Didn't man. I just preach a whole sermon on that a few weeks ago? About how, hey, you know what? If you kill yourself, you kill the body. Look, I killed Ankatuanko. I did not kill Ankatuanko. And it's my soul that has eternal life, not my body. Right. And so it's very clear around here because we preach it. Yeah. But look, it's not very clear to most people. But what does Habakkuk 2 verse 2 say? And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. When it says that he may run, once again, this is not literally a race. Okay, We're talking about running today. It's talking about running the Christian race. Right. Okay? And if you don't make it plain, people aren't going to be able to successfully run the Christian race. 
you must make it plain what is needed to be done. And see, when it comes to preaching the gospel, if people don't understand it very plainly and simply, they're not going to be running that part of the Christian race and preaching the gospel because they're afraid. They don't really know. Now turn to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And, you know, honestly, I, I believe this, and it's sad, but I believe that most people here in the Philippines that are saved, only referring to saved people, if they had somebody literally drop on their knees and say, what must I do to be saved, they would not know how to get them saved. Right. That's what I believe. And that's sad, but it's reality. When I first got saved, I would not have been able to lead someone to the Lord. Right. I didn't know because it was new to me. I didn't know how to do it. The sad thing is, you know, a lot of people that are saved, honestly, they just don't know the Bible that well. And they're very confused. And that's why it's very important for churches, especially with salvation, to make that first step plain. Yeah. Look, you've got to make it plain what salvation is and what it isn't. And, and the reality is that most people that are saved, they believe that 20% of this country is saved. Most people that are saved believe the majority of people at Victory are saved. Most people that are saved believe the majority of people at CCF are saved. Most people that are saved believe the majority of Pentecostals and born again are saved. Man, a lot of people that are saved in this country think a lot of the Catholics out there are saved. <laughs> and I'm talking about people that are saved, but they, they understand so little about salvation that they don't realize that these people are preaching a false gospel. Right. Right. And yes, there's a remnant of people that are saved in victory that need to get out and go to a real church. Yes, there's a small remnant at CCF that need to get out and go to a real church. But you know what? The amount of people that are saved at those churches is very small. Right. right. Very small. That's the reality. And look, you know, there's members of our church from victory. Ask them about it. And they're going to tell you that, yeah, you know, the majority of people aren't saved. And I wasn't saved when I was at that church until I heard the gospel. From, you know, pastor online. I mean, it's sad, but it's reality. Look, just because someone says they're not Catholic doesn't mean they're saved. Right, right. right. Just because they're not part of that cult or one of these other cults or the Catholic church does not mean they're saved. Yep, right? yep. The amount of saved people is very small because the Bible says narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. It's very narrow, not because it's difficult. It's very narrow because there's only one way. And the sad reality is most people are trusting in their works. Right, right. The truth is the truth. 1 John 5, verse 13, it says, These things have I written on you, that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. See, the Bible says that God wants you to know that you have eternal life. Isn't it true that most people say you must wait until your dying day to find out if you're going to heaven? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they say that, what they're actually telling you is, I'm not saved. Right. I don't right. know if I'm going to heaven. How arrogant of you to think that you know you're going to heaven. How conceited of you. I am up a kumbaba because of the fact I don't know. And actually, you just, you actually just don't know what the Bible says. Right. Because the Bible says he may know. Right. And right. so, look, for them to say they don't know if they're going to heaven, they're showing you they don't. Yeah. They don't know if they're going to heaven because they're not. Yeah. Because once you're saved, you have the spirit of truth. Well, you know you're going to heaven. Well, how can you know you're going to heaven? Well, going back to verse 10, it's going to make it very clear. 1 John 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of the Son. Now, I go to these passages a lot during sermons to explain this. And you say, why? Because we want to make sure that everyone understands salvation very clear at this church. Right. We have new people that come in. We want them to make sure they understand it very clear and they know what's true and what's false. Okay? And so in verse number 10, it says we must believe the record that God gave the Son. Basically, you believe what's written about Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. If you do not believe what's written about Jesus Christ in this book, then you're calling him a liar. You're basically saying, God, I don't believe you. I don't believe what you said. Okay? And so what does it tell us in 1 John 10, 5, 1 John 5, if you have 10 chapters in 1 John, there's a problem. 1 John chapter 5, <laughs> verse 11, verse 11, and this is the record. So what is the record? That God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The Bible says this life, eternal life, spiritual life, is in his Son. Amen. Amen. It is not in Muhammad. Uh, yeah. It is not in Buddha. It is not in any church or any religion or any person. No, it's in his son, Jesus Christ. And so if you believe there is two ways to get to heaven, or three ways, or more than one, you are not saved. 
right? Man. We must believe that life is only in his son. That's what you, I mean, Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the on. The way, which means there's not two ways. He's the way. Right. right. There are not, you say, well, there's, a, there's another way to get to heaven for the people that live in India because they're Hindu. No, those people need to believe in the true God and get saved. Man, right. You say, there's another way to get to heaven for them in the Muslim country. No, they need to believe on Jesus and get saved. Look, you go to Baptist churches and ask the pastors, ask them this question, what about people that never hear the true gospel? And quite honestly, a lot of those pastors will say, I don't know, it's in God's hands. Right. I don't know what happened. Right. I mean, the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. Right. Right. What part do you know? What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is the, the truth. That is the answer. But it's an answer a lot of people get offended by. So, quite honestly, they don't want to believe that. Right. Look, the Bible says you must believe life is in his son. And you know what? It is sad that we have false religions all over the world. And the way to fix that is to get churches started and to preach the gospel and reach those areas. But look, it doesn't matter whether you're born here in the Philippines or born in the United States or born in a Muslim country. Look, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is why that statement is so foolish. Because people bring up that question and say, well, how unfair is that for yeah. God you know, yeah. in a Muslim country or a Hindu country? This is why that's foolish. Nobody is born saved. Right. Right. Every single person must change their mind about what they believe until, before they believe in the true gospel. Right. Now, yes, some people are raised by saved parents, but even still, they reach that age and they must change their mind once they're old enough to comprehend these things to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And if they, look, I was raised, and guess what? If I had died as a baby, I would have gone to heaven. Because when you're before that age of understanding, God will send you to heaven. That's a whole other sermon. The Bible proves that. But then once you reach an age where you can understand, you must change your mind. Because the world will always teach you work, 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 work. And that's what you naturally believe. You must change your mind about that to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So look, every single person in this room, hey, no, we were not born Muslim. But we're still born with a false system that's going to send us to hell. Yeah. Even if you were raised Baptist and your parents are saved, you still must change your mind about what you believe and believe on Jesus Christ. Right. right. Once you reach that age, you must be born again, the Bible says. So to say, well, what about people in a Muslim country? What about people in, a, in the Philippines that are born Catholic? What about if you're born in a Protestant family? What if you're born even to a Baptist family with the right message of salvation? You still must change your mind and believe on Jesus Christ. And you can sit all day and say how you think it's unfair. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what the Bible says. Yeah. The Bible says life is in his son. And if you don't believe that, you're not saved. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. But it also says God has given to us eternal life. What does it mean by God's giving us eternal life? It basically means it's a gift. And if it's a gift and God's giving it, you say, well, Kylo and Cone, 15 pesos. Well, he's not giving us a gift then. Right. I'm charging you money. Or if I said, No, I'm, I'm requiring him to obey what I say. Right. That's not a gift. I'm not giving him eternal life. And if God says, well, here is the son of God, but you need to be a good person. That's not a gift. Yeah. You're doing something to earn it. So people to be saved, they must understand that their good works, their baptism, their church membership, none of that stuff is going to get them to heaven. They must believe it is a gift, and they must believe it is eternal life. Yeah. As I mentioned in the first sermon, Ya'ano katagal buhay na walang hanggan. It means it lasts forever. And if you think you can lose your salvation for any reason, you're not saved. Why? Yeah. You're still trusting in your works to get you to heaven. Amen. Now, making that statement offends a lot of people because that means a vast majority of this world is unsaved. Right. And, yeah. when the, and, and here's the sad thing. Which, this is the truth. The sad thing is when you get saved... You understand that, that it's narrowed against the heaven. But when I first got saved, I thought, well, one-third of the world says they're Christian. And, you know, probably, you know, one-third of those people are actually saved. So, yeah, one-ninth of the world, that's pretty narrow. But actually, you start realizing the road to heaven is actually very narrow. Yeah. Very few people are on that path. Very few people believe the right thing. And that is sad. But I'm not going to put a blanket on my head and pretend it's not real. I mean, yeah. The truth is, yes, very few, very few people are saved. And sometimes people say this thing, well, they have this attitude, I don't want to believe this because if this is true, then that means all my relatives are in hell. Yeah. Well, you can either just pretend it's not true. Look, you can jump off a cliff and just pretend you won't die when you hit the ground. <laughs> it doesn't change reality. Or what you can do is believe on Jesus Christ and try to rescue as many of your family members as you possibly can. Yeah. And look, unless you're a fool, you're going to just believe on Jesus Christ and you're going to try to do that. 
And look, I get it. Most of us, the vast majority of your family is Catholic. And guess what? They believe in another way to get to heaven. Uh, yeah. That's reality. They don't believe that God's giving them eternal life. And they don't believe it's eternal. Because 99 point whatever percent of this country says if you commit suicide, you go straight to hell. Once again, if you commit suicide, you killed your body, not your soul. Yeah. And so quite honestly, you know, when you're saved, no matter what you do, you're going to go to heaven because it is eternal life. It never ends. It lasts forever. And so we have to make salvation clear because when pastors don't make salvation clear, their members are not going to have much confidence. Look, the world will brainwash you all the time. And so unless the pastors and churches are making it clear, the members aren't going to have any confidence. Turn to Romans 10. Romans 10. So one reason why saved people don't go soul winning is quite honestly, they're, they're kind of confused about some of the questions about salvation. Mm -hmm. They don't really know how to answer stuff. They don't know their Bibles. They don't have much, a strong knowledge of salvation, even if they are saved. But another reason why people don't go soul winning is quite honestly, they don't have a church to send. That is a big reason why people don't go soul winning. Romans 10, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it doesn't end at verse 13. We often quote verse 13, but keep reading, and there's a lot of information to learn. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him whom, in whom they have not believed? And so, look, you can pray to God a million times, but if you don't believe in your heart, it's, it's meaningless. Right. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So you must hear the gospel from somebody else before you get saved. Yeah. Nobody gets saved on their own. Right. Man. You have to understand, God set up your entire life as a system to make you humble. He does not want you to become arrogant. And if you could say that I got saved on my own, you could be very arrogant about that. Right. right. God does not allow it because he says, lest any man should boast. He does not want you to boast about your salvation at all. And we can't boast because everybody in this room, you heard the gospel from somebody else. Yeah. Okay. I heard the gospel from somebody else and I would have gone to hell without that. And he says, how should they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So how are you going to preach the gospel unless you're sent? What does it mean by sent? Well, I mean, obviously we sing the song, So send I you to labor unrewarded. But at the same time, that comes through a church. Yeah. Right. A church sends you to preach the gospel. They give you a map and they say, here's your soul winning partner. And you go out and you preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. If you did not have a church sending you, though... You'd probably come to church and that would be it. But what do we do at 2.20 every single day? We pair you up and say, here's where you're knocking. Knock those doors. We're sending you out to preach the gospel. What do I do every Sunday? I pair up with someone and I go out and I preach the gospel. Look, you need a church to actually send you. We're doing this together. It doesn't come on your own. Right. And this is, this is what happens with people that aren't really involved that much with church. They might have zeal to go soul winning for a little while. It's going to die out. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're, they're just not going to do it for very long. You say, why? Because they don't have anybody sending them out to preach the gospel. But see, when you're in a church and involved, that church will constantly send you out, if it's a real church, to preach the gospel. Now, most people go to churches that never send them out. But, you know, obviously here, we send you out to preach the gospel. But look, most people, if they don't go so they have no confidence to, to preach the gospel because nobody's sending them. Turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. And so, look, you know, I, I always find it encouraging when you meet people that are, are motivated in preaching the gospel and um, they don't really have a church that sends them. But even for that to be successful, they really need to kind of band together to go out to preach the gospel. Like, for example, you know, we have a group in, we, group in Singapore that gets together and they go out and preach the gospel. But they're almost kind of creating their own church. You know, they listen to live stream sermons and they go out and go so many. They can encourage one another. But you need that sort of system. Yeah. And look, many of you, before this church started, you understood salvation very clearly, but most of you probably didn't go soul winning that much. Right. Right. So why? Because you don't have a church that's sending you. Right. You need to be part of some sort of organization or church that's going to send you to preach the gospel. And obviously when I say organization, how God operates is through the local church. Now, some of you did get together before this church started, and you were going soul winning, but the reality is that would not have lasted forever. Yeah. Eventually, you need a church to just send you out. Okay. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we have the story of David and Goliath. This is probably the most exciting chapter in the Bible, I think. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 8, the Bible reads, 
And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? And not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. He be able to fight with me and to kill me. Then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and servants. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So Goliath is mocking the enemy. He's right. mocking the opponents. Verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So everybody is afraid because of one man. <laughs> Goliath is only one man. Now look. Yes, Goliath was a giant. He was very tall. But as we talked about last week, we're not talking about 200 people tall. <laughs> he's one man. And quite honestly, one man does not destroy an entire army. But they're afraid because of this one man. Okay. Now, who should have fought Goliath? King Saul. Right. For one, he's the leader. For two, he's the tallest person. Right. The Bible says he was head and shoulders above everybody else. The leader should be fighting the battle. You know, there was actually a time in history where leaders actually went and fought the battles themselves. That's true. Right? Yeah. And so the way we live in the world today, presidents or rulers, they never go and fight the battles. See, it's very easy to send your country off to war when you're not in front of battle. Yeah. It's a lot more difficult if you're President Trump and you say, well, you know, we're going to fight the battle. I'm going to be the first person in line with that machine gun. You know what? You're not going to be so quick to just start a war with some random country. Are you? Yeah. But see, there was a day when leaders fought the battle, and that's what King Saul should be doing. He is not fighting the battle, so everybody is afraid because of that. Drop down to verse number 45. 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord hath saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. One man is willing to fight Goliath. Only one man. And it's King David. Well, he's not the king of It's David willing to fight the battle. Go down to verse number 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. He kills Goliath and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So because one person dies, the Philistines are afraid. Now remember, all the Israelites are greatly afraid for this takes place. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines. Look, David only killed one man, but because David was willing to fight that battle, everybody else had confidence to fight the same battle right, and right. go after the enemy. But when it comes to soul winning, you need a church to be willing to fight that battle. Now, there's no question that I need you to fight this battle because if I did, if nobody went soul winning and didn't want to, I wouldn't have confidence either. But at the same time, you have churches where the pastors never go soul winning. Right. 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 They never go soul winning. They never lead the charge. They might even pair you up and say, "Well, I'm just going to sit back. I got, I got work to do." Now, I understand that you know running a church it takes a lot of work, and there are times that I have work that I need to do. But I go so many multiple times every single week, right, and I will right. never change. It doesn't matter how busy you get; you need to be able to go soul winning. And look, when your members see the leader just being like, "Well, I can't fight Goliath," then they're not going to go and fight the battle. Right. They want to follow the leader, and if the leader's never going to fight the battle, if you have a church that either isn't sending. Or isn't being led by the pastor doing it, they're never going to fight that battle. Yeah. That's the reality. And this is the problem with King Saul. You wonder why no one will fight Goliath or the Philistines. Well, you're not willing to step in there and put yourself out there on a limb a little bit. Uh -huh. You say, Brother Stucky, you know, you don't understand. You've been soul winning for a long time. So I don't go soul winning because I'm kind of afraid. But you've been doing it for a long time. Look, when I started preaching the gospel here in the Philippines, I was a little bit nervous every single time. You say, why? Because I was trying to preach the gospel in Tagalog and learn, and quite honestly, it's difficult. Now, anyone who has gone soul with me in the last couple months, you hear me preach the gospel in Tagalog and explain eternal security and explain it's only by Jesus in Tagalog. And I'm able to do that, and I don't understand why people that have been pastors here for 20 years who learned that language as a child haven't figured out how to explain eternal security or how to explain the gospel. If I can learn it as a second language and learn how to preach the gospel, they ought to be able to do it. But look, when I started preaching the gospel here, I was nervous. Right. It's like, man, can I run into an American? 
<laughs> that would be really great. Run into someone from Europe, you know, from Britain or something like that. Yeah, you know what? I felt a little bit uncomfortable because when you when you start preaching the gospel in another language, you make mistakes. Yeah. Right? You say things, and sometimes it doesn't quite make sense what you're trying to say. You make mistakes, and you get nervous and embarrassed, and you learn through trial and error. You say, Brother Stucky, if I start preaching the gospel, I'm going to make mistakes, as did I when I came here and started preaching the gospel. And I say things, and it doesn't always translate correctly. But you learn through trial and error, and you have to be willing to put your foot out there and step out in faith a little bit. Right. Because otherwise, it's going to be 20 years from now, right. and you're still not going to know how to do it. Yeah. Look, every time you start something new, you're not going to know how to do it perfectly. Right? Right. You're going to make mistakes, but quite honestly, you've got to just do it and not have that fear. But the problem is a lot of people, they just don't have a church to sense them. Now, here's the thing at this church. Turn to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. At this church, though, you, you cannot say you don't have a church system. You can't say that I don't go out preaching the gospel. You can't say that this church is not really interested in soul winning. No, you do have a church that's interested in soul winning. You do have a church that goes out soul winning several times every single week. And so this church, you have a church that will send you to preach the gospel. But a lot of people still have fear. And you say, why? Well, quite honestly, a lot of people, they have trouble stepping out in faith. Okay? Ephesians 6, verse 18, the Bible reads, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I think most of us would say that outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul the Apostle, you'd say is probably the greatest soul winner, or most motivated, or most zealous soul winner that's maybe ever existed. We consider him the greatest missionary and the greatest church planner and the most zealous soul winner who ever existed. And yet, in verses 19 and 20, he says, please pray for me so I can be bold. You know what he's saying? I am not always bold either. Right. You know what he's saying? Honestly, sometimes it's tough for me to preach the gospel. Amen. Sometimes I get nervous. And he's praying for boldness. So look, if you say, man, I'm afraid. I don't know what to say. Well, realize you're no different than everybody. Because everybody is going to be afraid from time to time, and you have to step out there in faith. Now, the great thing in our church is this, that if you go soul winning, you're not just shoved out there with the Bible in your hands and expected to do the talking. Yeah. You right. learn as a silent partner. You go with somebody else. You know, when I first started preaching the gospel, I was a silent partner. And I was just kind of there along for the ride, learning from other people. And I learned what they said, and I heard what people said. And you know, over time, I eventually became the soul winner myself. Did you know that Moses in the Bible started out as a silent partner? Right. right. When he starts, who's the one doing the talking? Aaron. Why? Moses tells God, I, I, I can't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. See, Moses, Moses. And so the way you feel is no different than anybody's ever felt. Because that's the way Moses felt. Moses said, I can't be the one preaching the gospel. In fact, I still remember very clearly telling the person who led me to the Lord as he was trying to get me to become a soul winner, hey, this is not my gift. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not a confident person. You know, I'm afraid. I get nervous. I'm not an outgoing person. It's, it's just not my ability. But wait a minute. In the Bible, where does it say this is something that's your ability? It's just something you need to do. Right? Yeah. You know, one thing I've found is many people that are very outgoing are the ones that actually struggle with soul. Because honestly, they're not used to getting afraid in situations and having to fight through it. And so honestly, many people that have just a personality where they're really outgoing... They're the ones who don't do it because, man, I'm, I'm used to having confidence, and now I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. Whereas people that maybe are more introverted, they can have more confidence because they're used to feeling uncomfortable a little bit. Right. Look, it, it's just something where when you first start, you're going to be uncomfortable. But the great thing is you don't have to be nervous because you can go with someone as a silent partner, someone who can do all the talking. They won't put you on the spot. They won't embarrass you. They'll let you just kind of learn and grow. And eventually, and even if you stay a silent partner your whole life, praise the Lord for that. But honestly, you'll probably eventually learn and get confidence to do it yourself. Now turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. And so Philippians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, the Bible reads, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And so what Paul is saying is, because I am in prison, because I'm arrested, people are actually more bold to preach the word of God. Now that sounds kind of strange. You would think that with everybody just, with him being in prison, people would be nervous. It actually gives them boldness. 
Because when you see somebody willing to step out there in faith and uh, to go through trials in their lives, it causes some people to kind of step on the firing line and figure out what side they're on. Right. You know, honestly, there there was people that you know got into the fight, like-minded pastors, when they saw Verity Baptist protest in California, and they said, "Man, if, if that church is willing to be protested, I've got to be willing to step out of faith and show what I believe." And so, you know, honestly, the world we live in today, though, you don't even have to worry about getting arrested for the cause of Christ. Look, unless unless you're you, unless you're crazy, I mean, if you're just preaching the gospel here, you're not going to get arrested. You're not going to be murdered. I mean, honestly, it's really not that intimidating. Right. Honestly, you're just going up to the door, and, and honestly, most of the time, people are friendly. And if they're not friendly, then you just move on to the next door. We don't encourage people to argue and fight with people at the door. We just knock and just see if they're interested. And honestly, it's not really that intimidating. And when you start, you can start as a silent partner, and you can learn how to preach the gospel. And the reason why we do that is because that's how we all start. I understand what it's like to be nervous and afraid, because every single person... They start out afraid. But if you want to please God, you must be willing to step out a little bit in faith. And it's right. good to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Look, I would say that Peter was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. And yet, you know, him stepping out in the water, do you really think that's easy to do? No. And then he gets there and he fails. He starts to drown. And guess what? You know what Jesus did not do? Jesus did not put his foot on his head and just shove him under the water. You know what he did? He helped him up. Yeah. And see so you know what happens in your life when you step out in faith and you fail? What God does, he helps you out. Man, he encourages right. you. He doesn't kick you when you're down. He's happy you step out in faith. Yes, you fail when you step out in faith. Every single person, when they step out in faith, they're going to fail from time to time. There's going to be mistakes made, but that's okay. It's right. not the end of the world. And you have to realize that everything in life, there's going to be a trial and error period. But you have to be willing to start that. Now turn to Matthew 9. Matthew 9. And honestly, we can look at a lot of reasons why people don't go soul winning, but fear is one of the big reasons. There's many reasons for that fear. Sometimes it's the church's fault. Sometimes, you know, people are newer. I mean, there's various different reasons, but fear is obviously a big reason. Okay? I'm not saying that, you know, if you struggle with soul winning, that, that this one fits or this other one. But obviously, there's some reason you're not going soul winning because we know we're supposed to do it. And honestly, another reason why people don't go soul winning is laziness. That's yeah. another reason why. Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And so Jesus and his followers are doing all this work. But no matter how much they do, they look out there and say, wow, there's like, what, 13 million people that live in Metro. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much we go so winning. There is a great need for more soul winners and more churches. Same thing here. Verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. What does it mean to labor? Think of a woman having a child. When she's going through labor, it's difficult. It takes a lot of work. That's what you're implying. You think of someone who's a laborer, they're a very hard worker. And what Jesus is saying is, it's going to take a lot of hard work to reach these people with the gospel and to train them up in the things of God. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of labor. Verse 38, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And so what we should pray for is that more laborers will rise up. That we'll have more soul winners here in another six months. That we have more people out preaching the gospel. We should pray for laborers. Now look, when, when he says to pray for laborers, that does not mean that this is just some Calvinistic thing. Well, basically, God's like, man, I'd send you a thousand laborers if you just pray. And it's just like, man, I don't want them to hear the gospel unless you... No, I mean, obviously, obviously every church should want to have more laborers. But honestly, there's a part of, of getting God a hold of this and then realizing the main folks of our church is soul winning and praying God will send us more. And if we have more soul winners, it means more work. Right. Making the maps and things such as that. So if you want God to send you more laborers, you need to do a good job with the laborers you have. Right. And make sure you're reaching the areas and then God can slowly build that. Okay? Look, if we had 200 soul winners show up today, I wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> you should have been there for the first Red Hot Preaching Conference. You know, there was a lot more people than we expected. And we had lots of maps made. We thought we were prepared. And then all of a sudden, I mean, it's hard enough to pair when you have like 40 people. Then all of a sudden you have 200 people show up, a lot from out of town, a lot don't have cars. You don't know their names, and you're trying to pair them up, and it's like, what do we do? We don't even know. <laughs> Look, it would be tough if we had 200 soul winners showed up today. 
And so you have to kind of grow slowly with more and more laborers, but you need to do a good job and get it all under control, and then God can slowly build. Because quite honestly, you know, a church is not going to be ready for that many from day one. It would take a lot of work, it would take a lot of effort and thought. Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, next chapter. So they actually are sent out to preach the gospel, but I want you to notice what it says in Matthew 10, verse 10. Nor strip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stage, for the workmen is worthy of his meat. See, soul winning requires work. Right. And see, a lot of people don't go soul winning because they're lazy. They don't want to. It's difficult. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work. Turn to Mark 16. Mark 16. It takes work from the individual. It also takes work from the church. You know, it does take work to send people out to preach the gospel. I, I, this, these are reasons why. Now, I'm happy to be at this location, but there are some things I miss about Resolve Park. <laughs> Boy, that was easy to pair people up. It's like, hey, you know what? There's a thousand people in the park. Just, I send you any direction. <laughs> go wherever you want. There's just lots of people here. Here, if we did that, it would be a free-for-all. It wouldn't be that bad. You know, it takes work. It takes effort. It's not very easy. It says in Mark 16, verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. So notice how it says the Lord working with them in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. This implies soul winning requires work because this is a soul winning passage. The Lord working with them. Now notice the Lord does not work without them. You say, well, I'm a Calvinist. Well, you need to get saved. Amen. Right. Right. That's a false gospel. And right. the Lord working with them, he doesn't work without them. And so yes, you know, when we go soul winning, God works with us. If we don't go soul winning, then you know, God's not going to get... I, I've never seen God come down from heaven and preach the gospel. Right. Man. It's not going to happen. Yeah. He will work with you. He will not work without you. You say, Brother Stucky, Jesus is the Savior. Yeah, but it also gives a terminology that we save people. Because there's also someone who's throwing out the lifeboat for them to grab a hold of and get saved. Man. And the truth is that if we don't go soul winning, nobody's going to get saved. If every single person that was saved stopped soul winning and never preached the gospel to anyone, including their kids, then every single person in this world would be unsaved in right. another 60 years or whatever. The only way people get saved is if we preach the gospel. It is impossible for anyone to get saved without somebody preaching the gospel. Amen. Amen. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. That ought to encourage us that God works with us. Amen. God's not saying, hey, you go out and work. Good luck. <laughs> no, he's actually working with us. Amen. He's actually helping us. And when we get nervous, realize, you know what, God wants you to get this person saved. God wants to help you out. And when you step out in faith, God is going to help you. Yeah. He wants you to do it, and he's going to work with you, but he will not work without us. That's the reality. Amen. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8 and 9. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. Turn to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Once again, we are laborers together with God. This is something we are doing in tandem. Now, I understand that on the cross, Jesus died and paid for all our sins. And he rose again. But that was not the end of his work. When we go so when he actually is out there working with us. That is why we pray and ask God to, to give us power and boldness to give the words to say. Because if we honestly believe that God is helping us. Yeah. And there's a spiritual battle that we don't fully understand. Okay? It's not something we can fully grasp how the devil's trying to prevent people from getting saved. But yet I've been soul winning before, and you get down to the very end of the conversation, and madness happens sometimes. Right. All of a sudden they get that phone call right when they're about to get saved, and you know there's a spiritual battle taking place. That's why we pray for God's help. But guess what? God is helping us. Okay? Philippians 4, verse 3, And I entreat thee also, true young fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. With Clement also with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And the Bible speaks about women laboring here. Now I understand that women are not to preach behind a pulpit, but women are to, pre to pre preach the gospel. Right. Every right. single woman. God wants everybody to preach the gospel if they're old enough to, to be able to do it. You know, if my son is, is age seven years old and he's able to preach the gospel, amen. At any age, look, help those women who are laboring with me in the gospel. And so women can be just as good of soul winners than men, and quite honestly, I think usually better. You say, why? Because people are more likely to listen to a woman. Right. That's what I found. That sometimes women will feel uncomfortable if a guy knocks on the door, but they would talk to a woman. 
right. and quite honestly, you know, a guy would probably be just as equally comfortable with a man or a woman. Look, I've noticed whenever my wife and I pair up soul winning, she always has more people that are willing to talk to her. And this is in the U.S. or the Philippines, it doesn't matter. Because they just feel a little bit more comfortable. And so quite honestly, we need women laboring with us in the gospel. It is not just something for men, it's something for women as well. Now, turn in your Bible to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. It's, it's funny because, you know, true Christianity, when I say true Christianity, I mean Christianity that is right on salvation, but also really preaching the, the commandments of God and things such as that. We get ridiculed for being very prejudiced against women, as if we're very sexist and very prejudiced against them. Quite honestly, it's the exact opposite. Right. Look, you know, at, at our church, we encourage women to go and preach the gospel. Now, every other religion in the world, they are very sexist against women. I mean, you can look at, I mean, I was watching a documentary on, on Hinduism. And this is something I've known for a long time. Look, in Hinduism, like a hundred years ago, when the husband died, the woman was always burned to death. It's yeah. called Sati, S-A-T-I. And this is not a conspiracy. It's a fact. And she was burned to death as an atonement for the whole family. Go live in India and tell me how sexist Christianity is. Because mm -hmm. last I checked, we don't burn our wives to death if the husband dies at a young age. <laughs> you say, I've never heard of that. Well, it's a fact. And the reason why you don't hear of it is because, for one, it's embarrassing. And because the media, which is run by the devil... Ultimately, is trying to lie to you, make you think, well, every culture is the same. There's nothing wrong, you know, with, with Hinduism or Islam or these other countries. You know, we need to be accepting of everyone. It's like, man, those two religions are so sexist against women. It's like, and, and yet they accuse us of being sexist against women because we believe there's different roles for men and women. It's ridiculous, okay? Revelation chapter 2. And the last point I want, want to look at is not just fear, not just laziness, but a lack of love. Is a reason why people are right. so. Revelation right. chapter 2, verse 1. On the angel of the church of Ephesus said, Right, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Now hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Now notice in verse 2, this is a church that does work. This is a church that does labor. Okay, verse 3, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. This is a church that in the name of the Lord they are doing work. They are laboring, and they haven't fainted. They're still doing work. They're still doing work for the Lord and trying to serve God. But notice verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, this is a church that's still working, but unfortunately, they've lost their first love. Now, People have a different opinion on what this means. I think very clearly this is referring to leaving the love of soul. Now, I'll explain why here in a second. But the reason why I think it's pretty clear is because this is clear that this is a church that is doing things in the name of the Lord and have some sort of love for God. I don't think they're losing their love of God because they're doing some service for God. Okay, And also because if you look at the next verse, it mentions doing the first works. So the love is in reference to the works that they're doing. Doing the first works. So you're doing work. Get back to the first works. And what are going to be the first works of every church that even resembles a church? It's going to be soul winning. Amen. Because when a church starts, you're trying to build that church up. Okay? Yeah. Even churches that are lame, when they start, they have some sort of evangelism program. But what can happen to a church is that they can grow in number, and all of a sudden they can really replace all the soul winning for just fellowship activity. Right. It's a lot easier to do that. Now, you need a balance. As our church grows, it's good to have fellowship, and we do that from time to time. But when you remove the soul winning, there's a problem there. And this is what a lot of Baptist churches do. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because we're talking about a real bona fide church here. So this would have been a Baptist church back then, even though they went by a different name. And guess what? They've left their first thought. And so if this is something that a church could have done back then, it's something a church could do in today's world as well. And we need to make sure in our church that we never leave the first love. Our first love must always be soul winning. No matter how much we grow and have fellowship and activities, so what it must always be first. Amen. And right. anything else is something you do on the top. And so at our church, we have official soul winning times. We can't just replace the soul winning times with fellowship. Amen. We'll right. add fellowship from time to time, but you cannot remove the soul winning because if you remove the soul winning, then God might just remove that candlestick altogether. Right. Okay? And so it says, Thou hast left thy first love. And so what that's showing is that when you're not going soul winning, it's because you just don't have enough love. Yeah. It's been taking place here. Because it says in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. So he's telling them, get back to your first works. Get back to your first love. 
Now, turn in your Bible to Philippians 2. Now, obviously, we believe in soul winning around here, but honestly, it's pretty easy to lose your first love because when you first go soul winning, it's new to you. You're excited about it. Even if you get nervous, once you do it, it's kind of addictive. You get really excited. But eventually, it just kind of becomes, you know, well, you know, we're going soul winning. Now, when you first start soul winning, it's really exciting because it's new. But everything's exciting when it's new. Yeah. You start some new video game or whatever, and I don't play video games, but you start some new video game and it's fun, you know, for the first several weeks, first month. Then it's just, well, you know, you get sick of it, right? right? Isn't that the way things work in life? Something is new, it's fresh, it's exciting, and it can kind of lose its excitement to some degree. Now, first off, let me say you do need to find a way to get that excitement back because there's a joy right. in soul winning. Yeah. And when you're losing that excitement, you're just going to quit soul winning, and that's a problem. But at the same time, you have to realize that we don't live our lives just based on what's exciting or fun to do. Yeah. Right. We live our lives based on what should we do. Going to church is not always exciting. Now, some of you, you know, you were zealous to church before the church, but some of you, this is kind of the first church you've been in, and you might have thought, man, I'm always going to be excited about church. Because now I'm finally at a church where I'm going to learn the Word of God, preach with authority, a church standing up for the truth. And yet, you found that being here about a year, it's not always fun to be here. Right. You have some services you just don't feel like coming. Hey, that's part of life. Yeah. I love being a father, and yet there are times you're like, man, it's so much stress. I just want to relax. Look, everything in life has ups and it has downs. And yes, I get it. You know, this church was really exciting. Look, that excitement's going to kind of wear off from time to time. Yeah. And you're going to have ups and you have downs. But look, you don't come to this church simply because it's fun mm -hmm. or you enjoy it. You come because this is where God wants you to be. Amen. And look, yes, there's going to be ups and downs in your life. So many is not always fun. Look, I enjoy soul winning. I love soul winning. And yet, sometimes I go soul winning, and I don't want to go soul winning. You say, why? That's just what you do. Okay. Look, this, this past Wednesday, we had, we had preached at the schools. I preached like four times at the schools, like 45 minutes for each of them. And then we have Wednesday soul winning. Guess what? I didn't really want to go soul winning on Wednesday. It's like I've been preaching the gospel for three hours today. I'm tired, and i got to preach a sermon in two hours. But guess what? That's just what we do. Right. And I went soul winning because that's what we do. Right. And so even though you don't feel like going, you still just go. Why? Because that's what you do. And so whether or not you feel like so winning or not, well, the question isn't really what do you want to do. The question is what does God want you to do? Man. Whether or not you read the Bible today, well, you know, I don't feel like reading the Bible. Well, it doesn't really matter what you feel like. Yeah. What does God want you to do? I don't feel like praying today. It doesn't matter what you feel like. Right. I don't feel like going to church. It doesn't matter if you feel like going to church. Right. right. You go because God tells you to go. Right. Remember what we said in the first sermon, how to please God? The main thing is just obey what he says. Yeah. And you just do what he says whether you feel like it or not. It doesn't matter what you feel like doing. Look, I don't always feel I don't always feel like coming to church. Right. You say you're the one preaching the sermons. Yeah, that's more stress. <laughs> there are times I would be like, yeah, I, I just want to sit in a chair and just have no stress and no responsibility and just listen to someone else do it and not have to worry about it. Yeah, there's times I feel like that for sure. But it doesn't make a difference because you do what you're supposed to do. Right. Look, when, when I was, was at Verity or before that at churches in West Virginia, there were times I did not feel like going to church. And guess what I did every Sunday? I went to church. Right. You say, why? Because that's just part of life. You're not always going to feel like it. There are times I don't feel like reading the Bible. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Guess what you do anyway? You read the Bible. Man. It does not matter what you want to do. It matters what God wants you to do. And a large reason why people don't go soul winning is they just don't have enough love for the lost. Yeah. And that's not the only reason why people don't go soul winning, but that's definitely a, main, a big reason. I remember when I first got saved, and the first thought that went through my head when I got saved was, what about my parents? What about my sister? What about my roommate in college? Those were the four people I immediately just thought of, like, do they understand salvation? I remember the next day I told my roommate in college like, hey, you know, you got to talk to this guy, you know, you got to hear about, you know, what it takes to get to heaven. Like, he explained to me, I know I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. And I brought my roommate to the person that preached the gospel to me, and he preached the gospel to him. And he never got saved, which it is what it is. But I was like, man, I care about my roommate. And I didn't really know what, how to tell him. I remember talking to my sister and calling my parents. And it boggles my mind that some people get saved, and then they just don't even care about the people they know. It's like, man... If your parents don't believe the gospel, they're going to die and go to hell. 
Right. It's like, don't you have enough love? Now, look, I was raised in a very good way, so I had a lot of love to my parents. I loved the, the way they raised me. They made sacrifices. But for a lot of people, they get saved, and it's like they don't even care about the people around them. And it, it just boggles my mind. It's like, how do you not have enough love to try to get your family saved? Now, look, there's no guarantee your family's going to get saved. There's no guarantee your friends are going to get saved because this is a free will choice that people have to make of whether or not they believe or not. But you need to give them at least the opportunity to have enough love. Amen. That's what Bob teaches. And you know, the Bible says here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. The Bible says in verse number 2, having the same love. We're supposed to have the same love toward one another, the same love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 3, let each esteem other better than themselves. So on times you do not feel like going soul winning, the question you have to ask yourself is, what about the people that I would be talking to? Do they want me to preach the gospel? And I promise you the answer is yes. There are people that want to hear you preach the gospel every Sunday, whether you feel like it or not. And honestly, it doesn't matter whether you want to do it or not. The question is, what does God want you to do? And what would those people want you to do? Because we're supposed to esteem others better than ourselves. Your life is not about you. Right. Yeah. It's not about you. You're supposed to make yourself a living sacrifice. And the reality is, when you think your life is about you, you're going to live a miserable life. Yeah, right. What makes you happy is when you basically lay down your life for other people. Amen. And the truth is that when it comes to soul winning, we are esteeming others better than ourselves because all of us would love to just eat lunch and go home and relax for a little while. Yeah. Because it takes work and we're tired. Yeah. And because people wake up tomorrow morning and they go to work. But if you have love towards one another and esteem them better than yourself, what do you do? Just go out and go soul winning. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The entire life of the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not think about himself. He made himself a servant unto all. Isn't that what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ in life? Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. And we need to try to have the same life as him, the same love that he had. And so, you know, honestly, when it comes to soul winning, this is just something that needs to be part of our weekly lives. And quite honestly, you know, if you have the ability to go more during the week, you go for it. I mean, it's great for you to do even a little bit extra. But quite honestly, just making it part of your weekly life is kind of a bare minimum serving God. And so, honestly, we should be striving to live for God even more and more. And you say, well, do I have to? Well, I mean, how much do you love other people? Because the more you go soul winning, the more you love other people. All right. The less you go, it shows you don't love other people as much as, as you could. The more you go, now I understand, you know, there's a balance between living our lives and not just running ourselves into the ground. And I preach those sermons, don't I? I, I do not put ridiculous rules on this church or say, you got to do this and this, because I realize life is difficult for all of us, including myself. But at the same time, you know, we should be striving to really give it all to God. And if you want to please God, the more you do, the more you're going to please Him. And look, this is just the way that we need to be as people. And it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses on me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And see, the Bible says that we are to be witnesses unto the uttermost part of the earth. The problem is that, quite honestly, the earth is pretty big. And quite honestly, we, we, we don't have the ability to do so many marathons in every country around the world. I mean, it's way too far away from us. And what it says is you reach Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. So basically, you slowly expand. You have your area right here, and then you slowly expand to other areas. Does that mean what you do is you start going soul winning 20 minutes away and eventually get to like two hours away? No, we're not driving two hours to soul winning. What it means is you get a new church started. That's what you do. That is the goal of, the number one goal of every church is to get churches started. And the reason why is that the only way you can reach the world. Now, every church needs to be a soul winning church. But every church needs to be striving to get the new churches started. Because otherwise, this message of salvation is not going to reach everyone. Yeah. And as much as we reach this area, there are people all throughout Luzon that love the Lord and would love to have this church in their area. But they don't. And they don't have the ability to come. And there's an example I saw this week that made me pretty excited. That, uh, a couple of my wife's sisters were out soul winning in Pampanga. And they go soul winning pretty regularly. And there was two other people that came to, or three other people that came to our preaching event 
you know, that we had just like a month ago. And my wife's sisters were there as well. And they saw them out soul winning there as well. And I was like, man, amen. People that even without a church sending them, they have enough, mo enough motivation to go soul winning anyway because they love them. And that is why we need to get churches started all over there because there's people like that, that they need a church because quite honestly, as zealous as those people are, that zeal dies out without a church. Yeah. And there are many reasons why people don't go soul winning. And honestly, all of us from time to time can exhibit any of these. All right. of us can get afraid from time to time. There's, there's some time for whatever reason you're really bold to preach the gospel. And then other times, for whatever reason, you're kind of afraid. Right. You're kind of worried what are people thinking. It happens to all of us. Yeah. It happened to Paul the Apostle. He prayed for boldness because he needed it. Right. And this is why you need a church banding together to do something. And this is why you ought to really, really take church seriously. Because honestly, if it doesn't come from church, it's all just going to die. Out. That's right. the reality. And so, honestly, when it comes to people not going soul winning, there's many different reasons. But let me just say, for those of you maybe that are, are hitting this with soul winning or maybe haven't come, look, you know what? We'd love to have you come. Honestly, it's not that intimidating. But I remember when I first started preaching the gospel, and the first time I really went up to someone just kind of randomly and invited them to church and asked them if they knew they were going to heaven, I'm really nervous and everything. And then I got done, and I was like, that really wasn't that bad. Yeah. Isn't that the truth with everybody? Yeah, yeah. The first time you preach the gospel, you're like, oh, I, I don't know. And then afterwards, you're like, wow, that was actually pretty easy. Right. Whether they listened or not, you said, that wasn't intimidating at all. This isn't so bad. And then you have confidence. That's the way it is for everybody. The first time is when you're stepping out of faith. And quite honestly, it gets easier after that. And so honestly, when you start, you can be a silent partner. You don't have to worry about somebody shoving you out soul winning. You can just come and just be a silent partner and learn from the person you're with. And then you're going to realize, you know, how easy it is, but also the joy of soul winning. Man. There's a joy associated with soul winning that very few people in this world will ever experience. Right, yeah. For many different reasons. One reason is fear. One reason is laziness. And another reason is just a lack of love. Let's close in our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today. And I just give you to see your word of reasons why people don't go soul winning. And this is something, God, we can all struggle with. And it's, it's not something that just completely goes away. We all struggle with it maybe caring too much about the things in the world, not enough love for others. We all get afraid from time to time. We all get tired and get lazy from time to time. And we do have lives to live, God, but help us to all make soul winning a priority in our lives. And this is the number one main reason why you reward people and how they get rewarded for the works they do, God. And as a church as well, we must be a church that never loses our, our first love. And our works, our first works must always stay there, God. Help us to reach more people. And